welcome to Just Thinking. This is Mary Greendale. The title of this show grew out of a lifetime of curiosity about many different subjects, some local, some global, and some in between. For each show, I will open with my thoughts and then bring on guests who explore the subject in greater detail. I hope the show inspires healthy discussions on camera and among viewers. To me, the sky's the limit when we are just thinking. Welcome to Just Thinking. I'm Mary Greendale. Today we're discussing project-based learning in the Holliston schools. Last fall, school superintendent Brad Jackson sent out his community newsletter with a bold announcement. He promised to remove the handcuffs from teachers. He was referring to the handcuffs of teaching to the tests. Specifically, he called upon teachers to rethink your lesson plans, to employ more engaging, personalized learning, Look for new ways to engage your students with hands-on, active learning opportunities. Inspire students to work together and identify opportunities for more collaboration and peer-to-peer -peer learning, and leverage technology where it can enable and empower student learning, but be, be creative. Technology is only an enabler. It's not always the solution. And most importantly, feel free to be creative test and fail. Failure is the backbone for learning. You have our permission and we have your back. Educators, parents, and children have endured years of increased testing like MCAS. That has consumed more time and energy, but most of all, at least in the eyes of many, has consumed the passion for learning and deprived students of developing skills they need to succeed. Jackson said he wanted teachers to utilize project-based learning as a platform and proceed to innovate in whatever ways they thought made sense in their classrooms. Project-based learning has been around for 100 years in the world of education. As children, we all learn by doing. So why hasn't project-based learning taken hold, and will this time be any different? I am a huge proponent of alternative educational approaches, perhaps to the extreme, so I love this idea, but I have to wonder, will it catch on this time? Are we ready now? I remember revivals of the project-based learning approach in the 70s and again in the 90s. These revivals followed protests from businesses that students did not have the skills to work as teams, did not have the rudimentary thinking skills to problem solve. If you go back to read the prominent business speakers of the times, they were all spouting this approach inside schools and workplaces. But in academia, we get swept up in the hue and cry for accountability, as if we can directly link just one year's education or MCAS scores to a student's future success or failure. Life is far more complex than that. So I start with one question. Will this venture be any different from all of the efforts of the past? Panelists today have been key players in this initiative in Holliston. And I will tell you who they are, and then I will introduce you to them. Ann Buckley is the chair of the Parent Education Committee for the Parent Teachers Organization. Ann Louise Hanstead is chair of the school committee. Ashley Stella is the science department team leader at the middle school. And Dr. Brad Jackson is superintendent of the Holliston School District. Okay, let's, let's begin. Uh, to all of you, welcome. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. and so that people can actually identify which one is which, would you just introduce yourself and we'll start with you, Ashley, please. Sure. I'm Ashley Stella. I'm a seventh grade science teacher and the uh, middle school curriculum coordinator at the middle school. I'm Anne Buckley. I'm a parent. I'm um, the chair of Holliston PTO's parent education program and I lead the focus group. Um, that we've organized to, to take this movement forward. Thank you. Anne Louise? Anne Louise Hanstead, and I am the chair of the Holliston Schools Committee. And, and I'm Brad Jackson. Uh, I work for Anne Louise, and I'm the superintendent of schools here in Holliston. OK, so can, Brad, I'm going to ask you first to just define project-based learning. Well, project-based learning, is, I think, as students and as parents, we're all familiar with the concept of projects, which typically are things that students do to demonstrate what they know. Um, the difference between projects and project-based learning is that 
in, as opposed to a project which just demonstrates what a student knows. Project-based learning is a process by which a student learns by doing a project. So they don't just take what they know and put it in, in, a, uh, in, in a form like a report or a trifold uh, uh, tri uh, uh, piece of uh, material. What they do is they use uh, the project-based learning approach to learn about something and then go about and tell people how they, what they learned. And, and so it's the process of learning that, bring, that integrates with the project. Might be a little unclear to me. Okay, okay so, so how can if, I clarify? If, if, so uh, the kid is normally going to be doing some volcano because I can remember doing five different <laughs> volcanoes. That's all. I know. Okay, so we were going to do a volcano. That was the project we picked. If if that were in project based learning, what would the difference be? So well, first of all, one of the differences is that we give students a great deal more choice than just everybody does a volcano. Okay. We try to look a little more broadly. In the earth science area, some students may study volcanoes, others may study, um, may study rock formations, others may study different types of things. And then they, they, with some direction from their teacher, in many cases, they uh, form groups and uh, do the research themselves, as opposed to in a volcano project that I remember doing. We had the information on the volcano presented to us. It was in the textbook or it was in the material that the teacher gave us, and we just had to recreate that material. So it was really no different, and it took a lot of time to make that volcano that mm -hmm. looked pretty, but they didn't really learn anything more. But if you connect it, connect the research to the outcome, um, they have a tendency to, and connect that to something that they're passionate or interested in learning about, those three things coming together is what project-based learning is, and those three things coming together is what makes learning more empowering, more engaging for students, and they retain the information longer. And I, and I absolutely believe that's true, because I know myself, I learn better if I get to see it in multiple ways. Right. So it's look at it, touch it, feel it, think, do, feel, touch, all those different senses. And, and fail. And fail. Oh, I did a lot of that. Well, and I, if I may, Pro Project-based learning and problem-based solutions are also multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. So where the volcano project, everyone's doing a volcano, it's paper mache. I can't remember exactly what's bubbling out at the top, <laughs> but 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 now they might be recording a video about the process of having created that. They might be presenting that to other peers in their grade or other teachers or the community. Mm -hmm. They might be writing about the process in addition to videotaping it, et cetera. So it's intent, and they might be discussing it in a history class. They might be learning about um, how the impact of, of the volcanoes in ancient Italy destroyed Pompeii and what really happened there and how that all comes together. Just reached into my back pocket on that, that one. Wow, right? yeah, I was impressed. <laughs> I can't double check you on that one. Mount Vesuvius. <laughs> right, Mount Vesuvius. So getting, I think, across disciplines is really shaping the story of the yep. learning in a different and way. And you must Definitely. know this firsthand. Yes. So we just finished in seventh grade. We just finished um, our earth science. We're finishing up our earth science unit. So um, usually in a project-based learning unit or project, students will have some sort of question that they're answering, and that's kind of driving the instruction forward. So um, in, a, in a project, which is not project-based learning, students would produce the same project. So there's traditional instruction from the teacher, there's labs, there's practice along the way, and then at the end, all students will create a report for National Geographic where they're reporting on the volcanic eruptions in some place in the world. But when you take it, take that same project and flip it to make it project-based, um, you're having your students be in charge of where their project goes, and so there's um, 
any number of possible outcomes of what they could do. So your students are going to do a video. Some might make that model. Some might write a report. And in all of those different avenues, they're still able to demonstrate what they learn that's based on that, whatever that driving question was from the beginning. And I think what Ashley has just said there is, is actually reflective that it's not just project-based learning that we're looking at, it's student-centered learning. So project-based learning is just one element within that. So we have multiple disciplines that we can apply here. Ashley has given us examples of some children may be doing a presentation, some children may still be doing the traditional report-based, but they're doing it differently. They're doing it with supports in place so that they have the freedom to go off and investigate the areas that they are passionate about. So that it, it engages them and then it injects that energy into their outputs and the results are very different. Okay, so if, was this an idea, <coughs> excuse me, that was sort of top down? Did this just, is this something that um, you as the uh, superintendent of schools decided one day? Well, hardly. Um, the. Um, I've always been, as you know, Mary, you and I have had conversations over the years, uh, that I've always found MCAS to be a very restrictive, and the way the state defines student performance to be very restrictive. And prior to the, um, uh, prior to last fall, in the spring, the uh, Halston PTO um, organized a parent education event around the movie, most, uh, like, most likely, likely to, yeah. to succeed. And um, I was um, surprised, excited, uh, more excited but than surprised, to see what a positive reaction that had in the community. Um, and how the parents saw that very quickly as something that made sense for their child and for their school district. And that, I felt kind of empowered by that mm -hmm. and that gave me the the courage if you will or the ability or the sense to go forward and say you know we, we I think this community will accept this I think it's a very when you are measured when your community seems to, feels it's measured by MCAS or by those types of results, <clears throat> I feel that same restriction that teachers feel and somebody needed to break the cycle and it was the, the um, it was frankly the parent, uh, that parent organization and the support of the school committee that caused us all, all the educators in Holliston to kind of just break free of all these, all these um, handcuffs is the word I use that we felt we've all felt teachers and administrators and, and I think that that is a good um, platform to say where this really was born from the most likely to succeed screening was the first event um, of its kind and it quickly then followed up with some panel debates with discussions including the parents and that was such an inclusive event we had um, lots of people who were early adopters and ready to run with it but we also had people who were nervous change is difficult mm -hmm. for all of us nobody likes to to run with change unless they've seen the outcome so we have people who are who are nervous about it but what we have done is we've been able to demonstrate examples of where it's worked in other areas holliston has been innovating for many years so we already have a, a whole breadth of examples that we can draw from what we're able to do is now take that to, to another level we're able to introduce it as Anne was saying across um, different disciplines so you're not just learning science you're learning mathematics at the same time you're not just looking at um, a project in isolation you're working with a team to collaborate and to bring something um, it, something forward, a different outcome, and it can be different for each group. It's, they're not being prescribed what the learning has to be. And as those parents are hearing from their children, I mean, I know that my second grade daughter came home and she's in a French class and they had to um, design a, a new playground. She's come up with ideas that are way beyond my imagination. She's got a zip wire going into a ball pit. She's got a drone <laughs> over the top to 
to see if the hammock is free for you to trampoline into a hammock. But you've got a, a spy drone who is checking that the space is available first. And that creativity and that enthusiasm is contagious. So the more that people hear about it, the more interested people are in taking it forward. I have to say, I'm not the least bit surprised that the community and parents in general, I mean, there are definitely some concerns out there, and we can address those in a minute, but that they were enthusiastic. Because if you really think about this, the parent of today's second grader, unlike myself, um, it you know, they're a generation or two younger. And what they're experiencing in the workforce, okay, I'm going to throw myself into this. I go to work, and there are no walls. There are tables. And I, I work in, you know, in an industry that's kind of cutting edge on the technology front, and, and it's very digital, but there's no walls. And I've worked in many startups. And you, know, you roll up your sleeves. You might be in marketing, but next thing you know, you're involved with product design or distribution or operations. And everybody's working together to solve a problem. And that's really how it actually works, even in larger companies now that are trying to adapt to that entrepreneurial project based sort of like, let's solve this problem together uh, environment. So today's parents are living that. They're living that every single day and watching their kids and asking, how are they going to survive in this? Mm -hmm. and, and the bigger question is, when they actually get to the workforce, we don't even know what it's going to look like. Absolutely. How are they going to survive that? And well, are we preparing them? That, that leads me to one of the concerns, and that is not everybody is on a, a career track that is going to take him or her to college or even to the white-collar job world that you're talking about. How does this translate for those students who ultimately decide to go into a trade or who decide to go into some certification program for, for something like a health assistant or whatever? Uh, I think that project-based learning meets all learners. It has the potential to meet all learners where they are. Um, you can have students who are struggling in the classroom to um, read, to write, to do um, some things that traditional classrooms rely on for instruction. Um, and then you take a, a project-based learning classroom and it's hands-on. Those students are in the driver's seat. They're in charge of, their, um, of the direction that their project goes. Um, and even if the student um, isn't sure at first what their place is, because the model for project-based learning is for students to work together, they can kind of figure out what that role is for each group member along the way. Um, at the same time, when you have um, a high flyer, for example, who really excels in the traditional classroom, they can still succeed in project-based learning because they can dive as deep as they want to in project-based learning, and they be can become an expert in whatever it is that their project is about. What about special needs kids? How do you accommodate for the perhaps well, severe think, differences? I think it's important that you we acknowledge and recognize that every child has individual learning needs. So each child is going to come to the table with a different skill set, with different passions, with different ideas. And it's important that we address all of those. Um, but taking special needs as a particular group, I spent some time speaking to the CPAC chairperson, Special, Special Education Parent Advisory Council, for those that aren't familiar with that group. Um, and the, the interesting part is that the special needs children do have projects that they work on already, but they are taken from the classrooms to do that, and they work with other children in similar situations. So what we need to do is actually work on inclusion so that the special needs children are integrated with the mainstream learners and that they can all benefit from each other. The other um, interesting point is that the behavioural issues that some special needs children may demonstrate in a traditional learning environment are actually reduced dramatically when they're given the opportunity to be flexible, there are multiple entry points for them, they don't have to sit at a desk and have a teacher lecture to them, they're involved and that, that freedom allows them to feel that they can try things just similar to their peers and colleagues in the same classroom. So I it's, a, it's a positive. I can see that being the case. No, nobody. I really don't believe many of us like talking heads. You know, people just sitting there talking at you. So, but, I, but as Anne mentioned, it's it's pre 
particularly difficult for a student who's challenged by who finds it challenging to keep their own behavior under control. Oh, yeah, for sure. And if you get if you get the if you get the ability to move, if you get the ability to have some choice and some voice in what you do, mm -hmm. and to put your own uh, perspective into it, and to pick something that interests you, and to be if, if it's if if a student is engaged, no matter what the student's ability, no matter what the student's skill or or, or, or area where they, they still have skills that need developing, this type of work will develop them. And um, everybody needs development, whether, you know, regardless of where they are on the, on the ability, quote unquote, spectrum. The other thing about project-based learning that I think, or any type of student-centered learning, mm -hmm. I actually think Ann's point is well taken. We really need to kind of broaden this conversation a little bit more from project-based learning because to something that just is student-centered learning allows every student has a skill skills where they are strong and skills that need development every student regardless of their IQ or regardless of how they might perform on an MCAS test every student has social skills that need developing or um, or uh, organizational skills that need developing or they need their creativity or their their ability to collaborate with others um, developed those skills regardless of their intelligence, shall mm -hmm. we say, yep. um, need developing. And these working together collaboratively um, on an area where people have things in common helps develop those skills. And that benefits everybody. Mm -hmm. Ashley, I want to ask you a specific question. I do have a special needs um, student who's now well into high school. Um, because he can focus on something in a just totally 100% mm -hmm. obsession kind yeah. of thing. How do other kids respond in this setting? Now you've got a, a little more freewheeling, all right? You've got some opportunity for them to have a conversation. How do the other kids respond to him maybe asking something that doesn't seem to fit? What do they do? I think that that's um, one of the, one of at least in my classroom, it's one of kind of the purposes of project-based learning is for those students to work on being collaborative with all students. Um, so as teachers, we always set up the classroom in a way that's gonna make sure that everyone is um, aware of the requirements or aware of our expectations. And I think you'd be hard pressed to find any teacher that wouldn't have an expectation to um, be inclusive and kind to, to all students. So when you have a, a special needs student with a specific um, learning disability, that's a reason why they are having trouble um, being successful in the classroom. Um, the teacher would first kind of identify what are the things that I could try and if at first you don't succeed you try something else. Um, and for the group work piece I would say it's something that you just have to establish in the classroom and a lot of teachers do that where you know our our first rule in the classroom is to be kind to one another and if your interaction with a student is not kind then that's not that's not something that's going to be acceptable in our classroom. Um, also there's going to be different requirements for the different group members so maybe one student really wants to work on a song. Um, I just had this in our last project. They really wanted to write a song. And this song um, was going to, ex going to explain how um, play tectonics um, occurs in California, what's happening there. And this song, they worked so hard on this song for, for weeks, and they were so excited to perform this song. And everyone in the classroom applauded. <laughs> furiously at the end of their performance and it, th those students were excited to perform. Um, I had other students who did a video super nervous to have their video playing in front of the classroom where they were um, hiding behind their desk because they sure. didn't want to see themselves, their voice on the projector. You know how they feel. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we went through right that already. <laughs> um, but when they, when they hear that um, acceptance from their peers, um, it it gives them that power to to feel accomplished and to feel like I I did something here and it's 
it's going to be part of their lasting learning experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just like that end outcome that they'll remember. They're going to remember all of the hard work along the way. They're going to remember that feeling at the end of the project, that, that accomplishing feeling of um, acceptance from their peers. Mm -hmm. I find it so interesting to think that some student or group of students wanted to translate into music. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not how my head works at all. But to think that somebody in seventh grade mm -hmm. would be, be thinking that way, that, oh, this, this is a song. Pythonics is a song. And to, to just go back to your original question there, Mary, about um, how, how would that um, very kind of like straightforward thinking student fit in, the thing that we need to kind of look at in the bigger scope of things is that the information available to our students, students is ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. It's available anywhere. Mm -hmm. Anybody can get access mm -hmm. to that information. They just have to click the button. What they don't know is how to interact with each other, how to collaborate, how to communicate, how to problem solve, mm -hmm. and to think critically and creatively so that they can turn that, that task into producing a song to then have the confidence to perform to a group. So what we're doing is we are equipping the students with the other socialization skills that they really need to survive in the real world. It's not just how to pass a test and how to get get a good grade on your college application. It's how do you actually operate around other people? How do you how do you react within a team? How can you then apply that so that when you're out in a working environment, most people don't work independently. They have to work with people with a different skill set to them and sometimes it's challenging. Mm -hmm. And at least we're preparing them for those those adventures that they're going to have in their future lives. And I think to your question earlier the example I gave happened to be one that is happening inside the walls of an office, but I think it's precisely the point of this more innovative approach to um, teaching that allows all children to graduate prepared for the world regardless of that path. If that path is taking them to the trades or a gap year or to college or something else, we're teaching them skills they need to succeed in life. Mm -hmm not just to do well in college. Even in personal cetera. relationships, as I'm listening to you. Well, I think yeah. that is life. That's, yeah. that's exactly that's, what it is. Because yeah. when you sit down and hire someone, really, you want to know if you're going to be able to work with that person. Right. <laughs> um, so, And in fact, um, on, if, you, if you look at the Beyond Measure mm -hmm. movie, it's a follow-up. Um, screening that we did just last week. Um, the response was huge. But in that, you're looking at um, employers such as, such as Google, their senior vice president of operation, people operations, says that the, the people with the highest test scores are not necessarily the smartest people. They don't even look at college grades. They don't look at GPAs. They don't want to know which college you went to. They want to know if you're a team player. They want to know if you're a good person to have on their team who can make ideas is come forward and can share those with people. So even, even in the workplace, the, the, the MCAS is kind of getting diluted. It's not just a number that people are interested in. It can't be because the information is everywhere. So how does this all fit into what is a hyperstructure, superstructure rather, that, that is national right now where um, the whole attitude is going in the other direction. It's, it's becoming stricter and more test oriented and it seems like um, you know, that's all there is. How do you live in that? Brad, uh, you're the one who's got their backs as you already um, said. How do you survive in this? Not you, but the system. Well, I think first of all, it's not just a question of me having their backs, it's a question of whether the community has their back. So if, and I'm not saying this is going to happen because actually the studies suggest otherwise, mm -hmm. but if MCAS scores should start to go down a little bit, that's going to be the test of how this community really reacts to this. Mm -hmm. And um, I frankly, I don't think that's going to happen for two reasons. First of all, the new MCAS has been designed to instill a little bit, a little bit of problem solving into it so that it's theoretically not as, um, not as um, just content repetitive, heavy. content based, mm -hmm. yes. And um, so that's the theory. I, I haven't seen that come quite yet, but I, that's the direction theoretically they're going in. But nonetheless, 
you know, as Ann said, this information is, you know, if it's on their phone, mm -hmm. why do they need to know it? Those are the questions. I mean, there's you certain mean, why things. Why do you need to teach them in school? And, oh, and why do we use school time to do that? There are certain things they need to understand. I get that. I agree with that. There are, there's content and there's skills. The problem is that MCAS focuses only on content, and we are trying to teach essential content, not all the content, but essential content, and focus a lot on the skill development, because in the end, you need both. MCAS only, t only tests one, and it tests, if it's a trivia test, which it has been in the past, then even what it tests is not what anyone needs to be successful in the real world. And I think Holliston has the history, I think Holliston can call on its history to look beyond that. Holliston, you know, I, you mentioned, you started in your intro talking about my newsletter to parents. What I said in that newsletter to parents is, if MCAS was around 30 years ago, do you think Sam Placentino would have been able to start a French immersion program? Mm -hmm or a Montessori program? Mm. Of course not. Everybody would have said, oh, what's going to happen to MCAS? And, um, and the, the opposition would have, been, would have been very high. This community, however, part of its value system is, and part of the pride it takes in its local public schools is the choice that we give parents, whether they want to go into Montessori, French immersion, or our traditional programs. And they, this community has an inordinate amount of pride about that, about those offerings, and the kind of the innovation that that represents. And I think, I think that's why people moved to Holliston. I think that's why parents reacted so incredibly positively to the screening of those movies. And <coughs> even if, even if test scores take a, what's called an implementation dip, which mm -hmm. is a temporary dip before they re-emerge re, uh, at the same or higher levels, I think Halston will have the patience to endure that. And frankly, it's my job to, if I have to, with the school committee behind me and parents um, like Ann and the PTO focus group mm -hmm. behind me, I, I think that Holliston will endure that implementation dip. I just want to add to this that I'm less concerned about what we're trying to do inside these walls here and inside the district. Um, but you brought up an interesting point, how do you buck a national trend? And I actually do believe there is an undercurrent nationally pushing back against the extraordinary amount of uh, testing that is mandated across states throughout the nation. Um, Last spring, the entire school committee went up to the State House and met with the Board of Education on this very topic. I don't even know if we ever shared that with you, but um, we sat down with the Deputy Commissioner at the time and expressed our concern that testing was beginning to choke the innovation out of education. And, and in addition to that, additional state mandates that were putting a greater burden on our earliest learners. And of course, we're still trying to get tuition-free full-day kindergarten implemented. Um, and, and so how do you do this? You've got third graders who are coming up and being asked to take a test that is an extraordinary burden. There is enormous pressure on our teachers. And where, wherein lies the opportunity for freedom to step back and say, how am I going to do this to make sure this child learns or this child? Because they're all different. Um, and as we began talking, to our utter astonishment, and you probably knew this at the time, uh, they were actually exploring adding another MCAS to the graduation curriculum, the social studies MCAS. Yeah, I almost that. fell off my chair. I, I said to myself, <coughs> How can you possibly think that adding more to the table, especially on a topic like social studies, to turn it into a multiple choice test, another test? And um, after digging, it was interesting. What appears to have happened is that 
there's so much attention put on the curriculum that's designed to get students graduated with the 10th grade MCAS that the social studies departments statewide were feeling a little left behind. Yep. And so the educators themselves had yep. apparently asked for this, not because they really want another test, but there was this imbalance in focus. Mm -hmm. And it was absolutely the wrong direction to head in. The right direction would have been to say, let's step back and figure out what we're really testing here at all and how we're assessing our students. Yeah. Yep. I would add to both of your points, actually, and talk about um, what the tests are testing. Um, I think what you can learn through student-centered learning is more in-depth knowledge. So you may not cover the entire content, but as, as Dr. Jackson has said, you're delving deeper. You're going into much greater detail. You're interested and engaged, and you're retaining that information, which in fact is then filtering into the test scores. So if you take High Tech High, for an example, which is the pioneer flagship um, school which has started this in San Diego, their MCAS scores and their test scores actually increased by 10%. Um, and then to look at the retention levels and how that actually translates into the real world, in Lawrenceville Academy, um, a very prestigious boarding school in the US, they asked their seventh grade science students to retake their finals three months after they'd completed it. Yeah. And the average grade dropped from a B plus to an F. So within three months, not a single student had retained the information they'd spent two years studying. Now that doesn't point to us needing more content. That points to us needing a different style of learning so that children can engage in it and retain that information and then apply it to everyday situations. When you I talk about circle, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but That's I want to right. circle back to well, one of the premises of your questions, which was this nationwide trend. And I get the sense that Massachusetts is actually poised to, to maybe buck that trend a little broader. So, for example, there is a... Um, a um, Senate bill that's being debated, uh, that was debated last week, um, sponsored by uh, Senator Sonia Chang Diaz, who's the um, co chair, the Senate co chair of the Education um, Committee. And it's about um, civics, uh, a, a, a topic that uh, Anne Louise is uh, very passionate about. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, um, and as, as are many, as am I. And, um, it's about uh, requiring civics education in um, schools. Um, and, but this, this uh, proposed law goes a step further because they, you know, the, again, using the concept, if it's not tested, it won't be taught. That's the thinking. Um, they uh, w were arguing back and forth or discussing about MCAS and how do we measure that. And they actually, in the law, in the proposed law um, that's um, about to pass the Senate, we think, this week, um, they have put essentially a project outcome as a indicator of um, completion of the of the course as opposed mm -hmm. to MCAS. So they are actually writing, the, the draft of the law is that instead of taking an MCAS, they'll have to com participate in some sort of civic project. Hmm. Um, that can be defined by the students, by the school, et cetera, around certain parameters which make sense. That to me is essentially, to, if that Blowing happens, up. That's, that, is, that is admitting yep. that there are other ways to determine competency. Yep. And that is what we're talking about, competency in terms of content. And um, if that passes, to me, that is a watershed moment in Massachusetts where they finally may start to think of ways to determine competency other than passing a test that requires you to fill in bubbles on a, on a Scantron sheet. So I do think that there is, um, that there's hope. Um, I think Halston is helping to push the state forward. Um, and I think that um, if the number of Twitter followers I have in Massachusetts is any indication, there's a lot of interest um, in what's happening here uh, because my Twitter followers are, and because I use basically use Twitter to, to share out examples of what's going on in Holliston, um, 
my Twitter followers are, are I'm seeing 20, 30 new followers a week, and that's because people are are interested in what we're doing here. And I think that, so I think that the, the trend is, I think there's an opportunity to, to, for the state to buck the trend and the, for the state to acknowledge that there are other ways to determine competency. I certainly hope so, because I, I do view that as being a, a modest, but still a blowing up of the current thinking to be able to absolutely shift to an entirely different As model. When you talk about social studies, all I can think of is, oh goody, they'll learn that the Battle of Hastings was in 1088, 1088, you know? That's all I can ever remember when somebody talks to me about history and learning and that kind of stuff, that I had to learn the Battle of Hastings. Whatever has it ever, you know, ever proved to me. You know what's learn, brilliant you know? about that discipline? It's actually not called history. It's called social studies. And underneath that heading at the high school level is psychology, mm. economics, and history. Yeah. And I think if we really thought about that for a moment, it is the ultimate example of an interdisciplinary discipline, if mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm. And it's often taught that way, actually. So, I, But there's so much more that we could do with it. Mm. And introducing civics, I'd like to see it as a graduation requirement, but Go with okay. God, whatever you can get done at the state level, fantastic. Right. Exactly. <laughs> there was a great example of social studies from the fifth grade um, teacher at the Beyond Measure event last week where she introduced some of her students who created a new Netflix program for, um, called Treasure Hunters. So those children had to learn about the entire culture, the history, the, the people, everything about a particular region to be able to run this competition as a TV program. And they, the, the students loved it. I it was great, um, a great engaging assignment for them to do. Yeah, that's great. Now, do you find broad success or not success appreciation of this among the teachers? Are most teachers engaged in this, or is this something that, I mean, I. So I think that everyone is on their own path. Um, Brad had mentioned before that project-based learning is um, it's a process and it's, a, it's an experience for students. It's not um, uh, something that can just be done like that. Um, there are a lot of teachers um, who have been doing project-based learning experiences in their classrooms for, for years. And I think um, what you might know as parents is that maybe those experiences are the ones that your children hold on to. Yep. Um, I personally have found that when students come back and visit from the high school, they always ask about one project that we did at the, at the end of the year, an engineering design project to build earthquake-proof structures, and it was the experience that they held on to. And so how great is it that um, if we have this um, encouragement from the community and administration to continue to develop more of these experiences for students, then you can only imagine all of these lasting learning moments that they're going to have to take with them when they go into um, industry and college and Whatever their whatever their future is going to be, um, I think interdisciplinary has come up quite a bit, and um, I think that there are great examples of um, teachers working across their different disciplines. Um, it's come up uh, come up a couple of times already today, but that's really what has the power to help propel project based learning forward because you can do. Um, one project in social studies, but if you make connections to um, the science classes and if you make connections to, to math and to ELA, that then you're going to be able to, um, again, have that lasting learning because they're not just learning it in one class, they're getting it four times a day and doing different aspects of the project with their different teachers. Um, How does this influence your professional development curriculum? Oh my goodness. It, it, it completely throws it um, up in the air and um, requires us to, to look at it in a whole different way. The best type of professional development is professionals learning from one another. Mm -hmm. um, so these examples, we had our uh, professional development day in January where we had um, all these, uh, these opportunities for teachers to sign up to meet with other teachers who had had some success or who had some failures. Um, to learn from them, and uh, so it's, you know, I think it's important to uh, give teachers the opportunity to learn from one another, to learn from each other's mistakes. It also takes 
it's, and some people are moving along this curve a little faster than others. This decade in education, if you look back on it, has been extraordinary. Back, it's 2018, in 2010, we still had, we didn't have a student with a, com didn't have their own, no, none of our students had their own computer that they brought to school with oh, them. true. Now, we've got um, Chromebooks in grades six through 10, um, moving to six to 12. We've got all this technology. Technology has completely changed the way teachers have to, have to look at their craft. And now, by this, this new approach and a more innovative approach to instruction, is also requiring teachers to, to, uh, to, to ask questions and to really throw out some assumptions that may have been with them since they were students themselves in K-12 schools. So teachers are excited and exhausted both at the same time. And so good quality professional development that allows teachers to understand the risks they're taking, recognize that perfection isn't required the first time, and that failure is an option. That's a, that's a um, concept we want to instill in children. That's a concept we want to support in our teachers as well, that failure is an option. Ashley can put together a unit and it can bomb. And as long as she learns from it and adapts and adopts her curriculum to, to take into account what she learned from that process, then that's, that's a positive experience. And that's positive for students, it's positive for teachers as well. And so professional development is that key to that, to learn so that others can learn from the mistakes of their colleagues. That's an area, though, that now um, makes me think about administrators and super, I mean, uh, principals and vice principals and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of tension in our community at times, and certainly in other communities, when a budget sh looks like it's just overloaded with administration. And yet, if you don't have principals and other people within their, each of these schools working with the teachers in helping to take that professional development program and make sure that it's working on a day-to-day -day basis so that when Ashley or some other teacher does have that failure that the principal can be sure that she's getting out of it the learning lessons that she's supposed to get out of it and make the changes that she should. So are we in a place right now where we have sufficient administration in each of the schools to be able to do this and follow through on the professional development you provide? Well, I, first of all, I, um, I have always subscribed to the notion that every, as we should invest as many dollars as we can in the classroom. And, um, but there are certain, we, we do have to keep our, we do have to have systems in place. We have to keep our schools safe. We have to keep them running. We have to deal with student discipline. We have to, all that type of overhead. Um, we have run very lean for a lot of years. Just recently, I am so grateful to the school committee and the community that we finally, after eight years of trying, have been able to, was able this year to reinstate the position of director of, of technology and digital learning. Mm -hmm. And that has had tremendous impact on all of us in, in all of the administration who can let the, who can focus, allow that person to focus on the, the digital learning part of the work so that we can support teachers. Um, and that, um, that is actually the only administrative, that actually brings us back up to the level of administration we had here 14 years ago when I started. And so, even, even then, I, I do want to point out, we have one of the leanest administration budgets per pupil for a district this size in the state. Um, and I think, I think what we have been able to do with that is actually fairly extraordinary. Mm -hmm. But I think your point earlier in talking about professional development, 
putting as much of our budget as we can afford to into the classroom, into professional development, and empowering and enabling the teachers to also have a voice in their development and education is huge. In fact, one of the um, key points in our recent agreement with the HFT was... This would be the teachers' union? Yes, mm -hmm. forgive me. Um, we agreed to collaborate with them in establishing a professional development council. So previously, professional development, while we solicited input from the teachers, was largely um, guided by um, central office in trying, you know, and, and there are reasons for that because there are a number of things we have to do because the state says so, right? So we have to make sure, you know, we're putting development in place to um, adhere to that. But when you're making this kind of a transformation in the pedagogy of the district and trying to understand exactly how we're going to do this bottoms up, it needs to come bottoms up. Mm -hmm. So giving the professionals a voice in their own education and development goes a long way toward ensuring that we're supporting them in what they really need to be successful. Okay, we have about eight minutes to go before we're out of time, and I want to make sure that each of you has gotten a across whatever major point you wanted to do. So let's take a break here right now. Anne, are you comfortable? I want to make yes, sure because I, I think yes. as, as the I, th I think that the um, the key point here is that the information is available everywhere, um, and that we do need to give our, our children, our students, that opportunity to reach their full potential, whatever that may be. We're very fortunate in Holliston in that we do. Um, get our high school students in. They, they get into great colleges. They get places in the colleges that they want to. That isn't our issue. What our issue is kind of taking a step back from that and deciding what cost that comes at. How many honours classes, how many advanced placement classes do they need to take to feel that they are ready to do that? Is that something that we really should be focusing on or should we be igniting that passion and allowing the students to find out where their interests really lie so that they leave high school already with a purpose for their learning so that when they go into these hugely expensive institutions which come next, then they complete the course in the time that they're about, to, that they are intended to, that they don't drop out, that they don't suffer from stress, anxiety, depression, all of these factors which are very prevalent in our youth today. Um, and, and they're given an opportunity to feel like they've had a say in everything as well, from the parent perspective and from the parent organization perspective. Those are the things that are most important to me, to make sure that the students are engaged, they're excited, but also that they're enjoying what they're doing, bringing the joy back into education rather than just learning for a test when they're going to forget the information as soon as they leave the room. Ashley, how about you? Is there anything that you would put out there to viewers? Um, I think that project-based learning is one way that um, students can be more engaged in the classroom. They can um, love what they're doing every day, get excited about whatever it is that they're working on in the classroom. Um, I think that there's a lot of great work happening at all the, all the different levels. There's great conversations happening at our professional development days with educators across the schools, sharing ideas about things that they've tried. Um, the Tiny House Project, I know that there's going to be an HCAT. Um, mm -hmm. filming of uh, what that project is at the high school coming up and in the middle school they're also doing scale drawings of um, and building these scale models of tiny houses there's all this like vertical alignment of of great things happening um, I think that uh, you know you could you could highlight all of those different things and there's so many um, things that have been happening for many years and I just think that it's it's really um, great to think about how many more projects we'll be able to um, see in the classrooms um, hopefully more interdisciplinary projects um, with the support of um, you know continued professional development that's going to help teachers who aren't quite ready yet to f um, give it a try because of whatever reason is holding them back mm -hmm. that if you know they can get that support and they'll definitely be able to kind of give it a try or to you know work with another teacher on it and and I just think that we're definitely heading in a really great direction for the kids. That's good and Anne how about you from a school the school committee perspective anything that you think is well I, I think first and foremost it's important to point out that this is a journey 
it's not something that changes overnight and I'm not sure by design we have not scripted a path for project-based learning and that's important because the angst that some parents may be experiencing over this comes from the fear that we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater um, and that would be a mistake to conclude that we aren't and we aren't for good reason because there's a lot of good things happening in our schools today um, I would submit that our honors classes and AP classes are not at the heart of the problem it may simply be how the instruction is happening in the classroom to align with the advanced curriculum that our students are passionately signing up for um, and in fact, if you look at the fact that we've grown our AP course offering over the last several years, it's quite different actually than when my eldest, who was in school here um, six years ago, four years ago, um, our children now have the opportunity to select many more courses that may appeal to them. Um, and I think that's important. I think it's really important that they can explore their interests in a diverse range of course offerings. I need um, to give I need to give Dr. Jackson a minute yeah, here too. Sure. <laughs> uh, just real briefly, I think um, the, while the conversation has been about project-based learning, again, I think it's important to remember this is really that's a subset of what we call student-centered learning, which allows students to explore their own interests. We had a conversation three years ago in the Superintendent's Task Force on Student Stress that said one of, the, one of the ways we can reduce stress in our classroom is to allow students to develop their own interests and to pursue their own interests through their classroom work. We've seen that happen. We have seen students, we have students who I know of three who were on the our concern list around potential for dropping out that have had that projects like the um, the tiny house has kept them engaged has kept them refocused has kept them recommitted to completing their high school education so when you see when you connect students to their learning amazing thing hap things happen project based learning is one way to do that but we're committed to all sorts of ways to to make sure student voice gets incorporated into our work. I want you to go out on one last line, and that would be the two um, Twitter accounts. There's your own Twitter account, and then the Twitter account that is the School Innovation. And how about you give us those? Oh, um, gosh. Well, the Halston Public Schools, um, if, you, uh, if you go on to our Halston Public Schools website, you'll see the um, uh, we have a link to our to so you can sign up for our Twitter feed, and my personal Twitter feed is uh, at Holliston Super S U P E R. So uh, you're welcome to follow me on that, and I I tweet out all sorts of examples from teachers about what's going on in the classroom with some really great examples that I think people enjoy and like to learn about. Using okay. the hashtag Holliston Innovate. Yes, and I also thank you. You're right. I also use the hashtag. Holliston Innovates to tag a lot of these um, as ways for people to search for all those. So if you go in and you want to search that hashtag in Twitter, and if parents, you don't know what I'm talking about about Twitter, we are going to figure out a way to give a parent education night on on, on <laughs> how to use but Twitter. There, there is also a um, Holliston Innovates Facebook page, so a lot of the um, parent community okay. uses the Facebook page so they can access it so that way. So Facebook, Twitter. Now HCAT. Now HCAT. Which, I'm telling you, we will have this all over. The information is there. <laughs> okay, thank you all very, very much. Thank I you. appreciate it. I know it's hard to get all of you together, but thank you very much. Thank you, folks. I hope you've gotten out of this what I uh, intended for you to, which is just to understand what folks are trying to do. And here we go. Okay, goodbye, and I'll see you next time.